I'm Rebecca Garrett-Pace. I'm Mitchell Boone, and you're listening to The Day After Sunday. A brief but nerdy conversation about yesterday's worship at White Rock United Methodist Church. We talk about what caught our attention, stories we forgot to tell, and ways that we saw the Holy Spirit moving among us. Good morning, Rebecca. Good morning, Mitchell. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. We good? We're good. I'm trying a new yeah. setup. See if I can get some better sound. Got that Yeti mic. Yep. Got the, got the mic. Got it close to my face. So we'll see. What'd you do last night after Palm Sunday worship? Um, let's see. I, I actually had a, I call them like mini migraines. So I had a bad headache and I went, I like took a really long nap in the afternoon, which meant then that I was not sleepy when it was time mm. to go to bed. So I, I read a while, I did some yoga, you know, just tried to to relax and not get my schedule too off kilter. What about you? Watched some West Wing and then uh, Cash got up from nap Ooh. and we uh, played in the backyard and That's awesome. busted out the old drone, got some drone footage. <laughs> and you and drones. It's, cleaned it's... up all the trash in the pond. Nice. Are you or are you just watching straight through West Wing again, or, or are you like no. choosing your favorites? No, I'm watching straight through. Really? Season five now, yes. Season five, okay. Mm-hmm. It's a great series. I've only watched it all the way through one time, but I should go back and go back. Yeah. yeah, you should. It makes you uh, wish we had President Bartlett as a leader during this COVID nineteen crisis. Yeah, I always yeah. Know what to say. Right. Yeah. Well. So do you, side note, nerdy, yeah. nerdy side note, um, do you ever watch YouTube videos by Binging with Babish? <laughs> no, I don't. You don't? You've never heard of him? Babish the, no. Okay. Well, then it's not a joke for you, but um, the, that is not his real name, Binging with Babish. He got that from the West Wing and he was like, I'll know you're my people if you know that that's the reference of like this random name that is not even my name. I just thought that was hilarious. I mean, Babish's character is a, uh, he's the, the um, attorney general. No, yeah. he's the White House counsel. Yeah. During- and he only shows up in a handful of episodes. He's one of my favorite characters though. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So you should check out Binging with Babish. It's a cooking show, which is apparently all I watch, but um Oh, yeah. okay. Little little nerdy side note. That's where he got yeah, it. I like Rebecca watching cooking shows. That's awesome. <laughs> That's fun. That lowers the anxiety too. Nothing like yeah. a good cooking show to like, you know, bring things down a notch and sure. remind us that it's all going to be okay. Yeah. I'll cook this thing in butter. Um, right. <laughs> and then I'll do Palm a Sunday. workout. Huh? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. Yeah. So it was... Um, it was Palm Sunday. <laughs> it was a little different. It Very different. different. I'm, I'm really, um, I'm grateful to everybody in our congregation though. It was just, it's always humbling and beautiful to see how many folks are engaging online. Um, right. Yeah. You know, watching, watching, commenting, saying where they're watching from, you know, mm-hmm. saying hello to each other. Um, we've gotten several stories of friends, you know, in our congregation who've invited friends who mm-hmm. haven't been to church in a while or who live in other states, you know, and that are just experiencing worship with us. So it's really moving that we're able to create that community virtually. I totally agree. And it's a good reminder that like, you know, we like to see you all, but it's also really important that other folks see you, right? Yeah. So like, it's, um, you know, it's not like we're just like, hey, it's great to have so many people watching us. It's more you know, something that, that I think is a, um, provide some unique space for our, for community. It's weird, but I mean, I think it means something to know that you're watching something live with mm-hmm. folks that you normally would give a hug or say, Hey, to on a right. Sunday morning. So know that, um, that we benefit from having folks tune in and I trust that the broader community is benefiting from folks tuning in. So yeah. So we did, um, I mean, not simply because we were virtual and not in person, but we right. approached the whole service differently than we have in past years. Um, we typically do, if y'all haven't uh, worshipped with us on a Palm Sunday before, we typically do the more traditional liturgical Palm slash Passion. 
right. um, where we start with the processional. We always start with kids and families coming down the aisle, everybody waving palm branches. But by the end of the service, we are, we're almost at the crucifixion. We really walk all the way through um, mm -hmm. Passion Week, you know, in, in sort of a fast forward because we realize that so, a lot of folks are not going to be able to join us on Maundy Thursday or Good Friday. And so we right. feel like we need to create space for the, for that story. But this year, it was very conscious decision on the part of the staff that we stayed truly in Palm Sunday for the whole service. Um, you preached from the, the entry, um, the scripture about the, the triumphal text entry. text that doesn't have any palms in it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I didn't um, make a, I didn't make a big point of that because I thought people would be disappointed. So we just kind of moved past that a uh, quick uh, reference to no palms in that text. Huh. I actually had not noticed that. Um, but yeah, so it was right there in the Palm story, um, yeah. Palm Sunday story, right? This um, dramatic entrance of Jesus into mm -hmm. the gates of Jerusalem. And I think. <sighs> well, and we did that on purpose. I mean, for yeah. me, like we, we often will usually end uh, Palm Sunday with a, what's called a stripping of the sanctuary. So sure. we out all the elements that we usually use um, to beautify the space um, all the stuff on the altar all of the palm branches um, the baptismal font all that kind of stuff and we are metaphorically preparing ourselves we're clearing out anything that could distract us from um, the hard difficult stories of jesus's last supper and crucifixion um, and to be honest i really felt strongly that this year um <laughs> we've already had to give up a lot for Lent. I mean, I heard somebody say, this is the lentiest Lent I've ever Lented. Um, we've Lent given up way more than we ever intended. And I just really strongly felt that this Sunday, we didn't need to, um, there, there was no need to encourage people to sit down in the sorrow any more than they already were. Um, that we could really draw a lot more out of this uh, story that we often gloss over that we just say, oh, look, palm branches, yay. Okay, let's get to the stories of, of uh, Good Friday and Easter. So it was, a, it was a switch. Yeah, and we've, you know, we've we started tacking the passion onto the palm story um, to try to get folks to a place where um, they could hear both stories because, yeah. you know, Holy Week is uh, not as well attended as Palm Sunday. Yeah, and yeah. So there's a, there's a need to kind of say, okay, look, we can't go – from Palm Sunday to Easter without going through um, Jesus's last week. And mm -hmm. if we, um, and so we've been really intentional about that, you know, it's usually stripping of the altar happens on a Monday, Thursday service. We've kind of pulled that into a Palm experience, which I think is, is really good, but you're right. Like we just, the heaviness of it all um, mm -hmm. doesn't need to be reiterated. Yeah. Um, we don't need to, do any extra right we'll reiterate it on monday thursday and we'll reiterate it on good friday mm -hmm. we don't need to go out of our way to kind of um to to try to get people into the the mindset that is um jesus's crucifixion before mm -hmm. resurrection and i i trust that uh good friday will be good friday um for a lot of us um yeah. especially this week as a pandemic kind of fires up across yeah. the nation you know folks are saying this is going to be like one of the worst weeks and um I think that just knowing that we have Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then Easter coming is um, this really strange paradox and, and also really beautiful opportunity for us to, to have an Easter where, um, where we can look out into the world and, and hope and pray that there is an Easter morning out there as well. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason, too, that we're calling for these videos, um, which I hope I hope we get enough that we can do this. You know, I know it's a Your video. Be, I find hope in the videos that you send us. Sure. I, that would be yeah. a good one. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I hope we I hope we get enough, you know, of, of videos that we can put those together, because I think that will be a powerful thing, too. And just like Victoria said in the children's time, it doesn't have to be big things. You know, I think we right. we sometimes get overwhelmed of, um, oh, I need to be thankful for these life changing things. No, you don't. I mean, you can be thankful for your favorite color in a flower that you see on your walk. You can be thankful for like having enough food for today, you know, and, and something simple like that. Um, you can be thankful for a call from a friend. 
Right. Putting on, you know, putting on your favorite shoes, even though you're not going anywhere. Something, something very small. Yeah. You know, eventually you have to cultivate that kind of gratitude or you run out of things to be grateful for. Right. right. Because like you could say like, I'm thankful for my health or I'm thankful yeah. for my family or I'm thankful for my job or my, right. But eventually that list runs out and then it's like, what else am I thankful for? And the, the quicker we can get to a place where we recognize gratitude and, and we're grateful for things that are small and mm -hmm. um, seemingly insignificant, the more we begin to kind of shift our mindset around like how we wake up and how mm -hmm. we end the day, like our days just change. And yeah. I think it's a really great exercise for our congregation. So something um, kind of related, it's related in that it also happened in the worship service. <laughs> uh, a question that came to mind while you were preaching yesterday was what do you think you open-endedly, anybody who's listening or watching this on YouTube, um, what do you think is the most important aspect uh, of Jesus's existence? Because I think that on, you know, and I'll, I'll lay all the cards on the table. I think there is no right answer to that. I think that all of the aspects of his life are important in different ways, but it is, it just, that question really struck me because as we move into this week, a lot of people say Jesus was born to die. Jesus came to die. And then other people say, no, his death didn't mean anything. His death was just a natural byproduct of living against the system. And his life is all we need to focus on. Um, and so I'm just interested, you know, to hear what different people may have to say about that. You know, is it his birth? Is it his life and teachings? Is it the fact that he defied the empire and was killed? Um, or is it that he was raised? Like, I think that's a really interesting thing to think about. Yeah, and so I think just to change, not to change the question, Rebecca, I think when we say like most important, we are making a value statement about that. Maybe um, maybe a better place or a way to frame that question where we're not trying to like peg, you know, crucifixion folks against incarnation folks would be to say like, where do, where do we resonate with Jesus's ministry? Like I... I'm an incarnational kind of guy. I think that that's pretty clear. I talk a lot about God being with us. Mm -hmm. um, I talk about this kind of abundance of God's grace that is kind of revealed to us in Jesus's own ministry and obviously in the resurrection. But I, I think it really doesn't start until we have God showing up in flesh and that, that decision for God to take on uh, flesh and, and dwell among us is like, revolutionary for me and and so like that's where i resonate i'm not much of a crucifixion guy in the sense that like jesus was born to die i think jesus was born so god could dwell among us and jesus's death is a natural consequence of what happens when god calls us into a totally radically different way of living mm -hmm. and um but i i'm an incarnation incarnational kind of person um I'm curious, what, where do you see yourself? Like, I mean, I think it's all it. of them. Um, I, you know, in our communion liturgy, we say the congregation responds, Christ has died, yeah. Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Um, and there's a big theological statement in that, that those three uh, things are the pillars of our Christian faith. Right, right, right. But I, when I write um, communion liturgies, I actually back up and say, Christ was born, Christ lived, Christ died, Christ is risen. Right. And, and I get the whole story um, because I think, you know, and of course, like the way I asked the question was uh, on purpose, was like to open us up to, to realize that there is not one most important part right. that we do need to like kind of zoom out. You don't um, have a place where you like rest in Jesus's ministry, like, or Jesus's kind of it's been different at different times in my life. I think, um, you know, uh, the, the people that I look to to have the most wisdom are the ones that have been able to say, you know, I've grown and changed in my faith. Sure. I, haven't, I haven't always thought the same way. And so I think I'm the same way of, as that. Like, um, at some times in my life, I really need Jesus the human. At some times in my life, I really need Jesus the risen Christ. Um, the cosmic Christ that is way bigger than human stuff. Um, and I think the, the power is that, that he can be all of those things. Sure. I feel like you're sidestepping though. 
Like, where are you right now? Like, right in this moment. I think I would be resurrected Christ, right? Because there's a lot of death in the world. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like I need a triumphant Jesus right now. But Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm curious. Like, when you think, like, of where you are personally right now, where where are you finding strength in Jesus' story? Yeah, I would agree. I think it's, um, I need the, the risen, Cosmic the risen past. Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Christ versus Jesus, if we can simplify it that much. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Oh, it's just so painful to watch. Like, I guess this is why this gets back to the reason why we can push, uh, push um easter or or palm sunday passion stuff we can separate them this year because we desperately just we don't need any more good friday stuff right you know like we really need a good easter Mm -hmm. it's just going to be really odd right to do easter i don't know i yes of course it will uh a friend of mine sent me i'll try to find it um because I don't remember a lot of the details, but she sent me a, an opinion piece by a pastor who was reflecting on this this year for us might actually weirdly be the closest to the, the first Easter. Sanctuaries is like focusing on the empty tomb. We are mm-hmm. staying away from crowds of people to protect each other's lives, to bring, you know, better and fuller life into the world. And that you know, the, the cavernous emptiness, um, is, and the, the fear and the unsure, you know, the feelings of unsuredness, I don't think that's a word, but, um, probably more closely resemble what Mary and Salome and the, the, you know, the male disciples more felt than what we do is to jump several weeks down the road when they had processed it and they were joyful, but Easter day itself probably was full of confusion and wonder more than, Oh yeah. Celebration. Yeah. There's this like weird, um, there's this moment, right? Right at the dawn, right? Right. As the day is breaking where the disciples are really scared. They have to be because like everything has shifted and changed so dramatically. And you have like different accounts of the disciples or or the, the women who making their way to the tomb by themselves or like under the like kind of, veil of darkness like Mm -hmm. there is this kind of sense that one they don't want to be found and they Mm -hmm. don't want there's not there the crowds are gone i mean there is something really holy and there's a mystery in the midst of that that i think we can really identify with this year Mm -hmm. yeah like it's going to be odd (laughs) broadcasting live from the garden just the two of us in the kind of dexter Dexter, right like it's going to be it's going to be kind of strange Mm-hmm. And, um, and but also a unique opportunity for us to hear this story mm-hmm. maybe in a um or it'll make it a little more tangible mm-hmm. especially that kind of that moment where where daylight breaks in but not it's not too bright yeah Just- yeah and i'm pretty sure we looked this up like six months ago but i'm pretty sure i remember correctly that actual sunrise in east dallas is seven o'clock or like 701 or something like that so we really are going to be gathering right there at the like right at the break of day it's going to be really cool remember when we were thinking about like how do we how do we do easter at sunrise each time and then it was like print reprinting the the (laughs) sides were going to be too expensive well and when easter is later in the year that means that sun rises earlier. Right. And so we were like, we realized people don't want to be at church at 6.15 in the morning. They just don't. Um, so yeah, we settled on 7 a.m. a couple of years ago as our standard, but it just ha- happened to work out that that's actually sunrise this year. So I have, a, I, have a, I have a suspicion that this year's Easter sunrise will be the best attended that we've ever had. <laughs> It will certainly be the easiest to attend. Yeah, totally. Just pick your phone. Yep. Right there, you can still be in bed. <laughs> well, one last thought about yesterday's worship too is our closing hymn, um, "All Who Love and Serve Your City," which um, is, I, as I've said on one of my daily song videos, that's one of my favorite tunes, and we sing several different texts to that tune. Um, but that's not a traditional Palm Sunday hymn oh. at all. Um, but I just, I really felt like it would 
it would serve us well, pun intended, to think about how we are serving our city and each other, how we are bearing its daily stress. Um, and when you said in your sermon, the cost of compassion, um, that to me just tied directly into why we sang that text of the of the hymns. And I'll point people over and over. I think the hymns that I try to choose are in themselves sermons sometimes. Um, so I'd encourage y'all to go back and, and listen to the end of our live stream worship yesterday and, and really listen to the text. It's also posted in the comments in our live video. And so just that concept of, again, how are we redefining what it means to serve each other, even in this weird, difficult time? Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the ways we're doing it is by staying home, right? But so mm-hmm. like, that is the most critical thing and, and is is actually fairly costly. It's costing us a lot to do this. And um, but when I think about our own congregation, and I think that's helpful, you know, we may say, what are we doing? How can we help? Well, one of the ways that we literally can help is by like taking everything really seriously. Yeah. Um, and trusting that um, the folks that we love, our neighbors, our family um, and folks in our community, um, and in our church are actually being are benefiting from the cost that is um, associated with uh, self distancing and and stay at home uh, orders and mm-hmm. and I think that in that um, is a whole nother kind of sermon or, or or way of thinking about our interconnectedness and um, our anxiety to like do something when the things that maybe are the most beneficial or not doing anything at all. And I think that there's some, you know, we can keep peeling back that onion until we realize that service is never about just doing something. It is always first related to how we are in relationship with our neighbors. Mm -hmm. And this is just totally inviting us into a brand new space to think about service as doing nothing or doing less. Right. And I think that that's just um, a really interesting place to kind of think about this text and how we serve the city, how we take on the city stress, how we take on, like you said, we take, we're taking on the anxiety of um, our County and Mm -hmm. our nation and our world. We're taking on the anxiety of our spouse or partner or our children or our neighbors, or we're taking on the, um, the stress of folks that we don't even know, right? Like healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think this like shared burden is a really important thing that we all kind of realize that we're in this together. And that seems so corny all the time. Remember like, remember when it was really like after a disaster or something awful happened, it was always like Boston strong or, Mm -hmm. you know, like more strong or whatever it was. And I always Mm -hmm. thought it was kind of like, that's just so weird, but because I'd never really been in in the midst of it, and now I realize that there is this identity that comes on with like shared self sacrifice that I've never really experienced before. Maybe nine eleven, but I was in high school and I didn't really have to give up much. It wasn't like I was trying to fly somewhere with a bunch of, you know, sure. liquids in my bag, right? Like, um, I I think that there is just something so costly about what's happening now, and we're seeing the benefit of that cost in real time, like Mm -hmm. in Dallas, we're seeing numbers kind of plateau and stay where they're at. And like, it's this just really strange thing. And I thought the helm was perfect because like, when we talk about serving the city, we talk about it in real time. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that we like, it's not a pat on the back for things that we've done um, in the past. And it's not necessarily just kind of thinking about what we can do in the future. It's a recognition that we're doing it now. And like, we are um, we are serving the city in tremendous, miraculous ways. And what's cool is like, I can look out this window and like for every minute that passes and I don't see a car, I recognize that there are others who are serving the city. And it's just this kind of, I don't know, it's just a really cool hymn to sing um, in the midst of what we're doing. Yeah. So thanks for bringing it in on Palm Sunday. Yeah. That wasn't like the palmiest of text. Right. Just like your gospel reading. <laughs> yeah, totally. Should have gone with that Matthew text if we really wanted uh, some palm branches. <laughs> so um, I am excited about Holy Week, though. And I'm excited because I think it's still foundational for us. And so we've got Palm Sunday done. And um, 
what's next on the agenda, Rebecca? We got yeah, so we day. have, um, so Josh and I are doing midday prayer on mm-hmm. Wednesday, um, which we have been doing, but this week we'll focus more specifically on the stories of Holy Week. Uh, so Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is each at noon. Um, it's easy to remember. So Wednesday is more, is midday prayer. Thursday is going to be a simple service with um, the two of us and Josh, um, and we'll celebrate virtual communion. So reminder, um, if you haven't you know, ordered your groceries yet um, and you need to get some sort of cracker and some sort of juice to be able to celebrate that with us, um, if you can't, don't, don't stress about it. Don't run around to five stores and, and stress yourself out. Do not. And then Friday at noon, we'll celebrate um, the stories of Good Friday in the style of Tize. So lots of singing, um, lots of, of hearing the scripture and allowing space for that to just kind of soak in. So there's not going to be a sermon. It's just going to be more um, led into the scriptures. And then Easter. And then Easter. Yeah. Sunrise and main Easter. Main Easter in the sanctuary. Yep. I hear there's even going to be an organ played. Yeah, and we'll have uh, hopefully if if our greenhouse you know is is able to to do that you know and I know businesses are real struggling right now we should have Easter lilies as well. So. Yeah, we kept some of those orders you know, not just because we wanted to make things look pretty, but I think it's also like where we can keep order, yeah. keep things moving, you know, it's important to still invest in those, especially small businesses that are trying to survive. So, and we'll, I mean, mm-hmm. sure. we need some Easter lilies. Yeah, it's going to be good. It'll be real good. Well, uh, awesome. I will see you. Tomorrow uh, at staff meeting. Tomorrow at staff. <laughs> Zoom, very familiar. Yeah. Join us uh, this week, y'all. Take care. Take care. You're listening to a podcast recorded at White Rock United Methodist Church in the heart of East Dallas. For more information, you can find us at wrumc.org. Make sure you stay subscribed to this channel to stay up to date with all of our content.